Good day, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. This session will begin at the top of the hour. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, as the case may be. Welcome to our webinar, Anatomy of a User-Friendly Evaluation Report. Well, many of you answered our poll question at the, about the height of the world's smallest dog. So Millie is a female chihuahua living in Puerto Rico, and she holds this record at just 3.8 inches. Your responses to this poll not only provided us with really important insights about your mastery of dog trivia, it also gave you a chance to practice answering a webinar poll. And we're going to have a few of these throughout the webinar, so now you know what to do. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, which is the Evaluation Support Center for the National Science Foundation's Advanced Technological Education Program. That's ATE for short. At Evaluate's website, you can find information about our upcoming webinars, as well as recordings and materials from past webinars. We have a resource library filled with really cool stuff to help with you with your evaluation work, things like a logic model template, worksheets for planning data collection and identifying evaluation stakeholders, and a detailed checklist for preparing evaluation plans for ATE proposals. Our blog features the stories and perspectives of STEM education evaluators, project leaders, grant specialists, and others. And we're always looking for new blog authors. So if you have some evaluation-related experiences or resources that you'd like to share in a blog, please contact us. You can email us, or you can use the blog submission link on our website. And last but not least, every year we gather data from ATE project leaders and prepare various reports that describe the activities and the achievements of the ATE program. And those are also on our website. I'm Lori Wingate, Evaluate's Director, and I am the moderator for this webinar today. And with me here at the Western Michigan University Evaluation Center in Kalamazoo, Michigan, is my colleague Kelly Robertson. Kelly, who has a wealth of experience when it comes to evaluation reporting, is the presenter for the webinar today. I want to acknowledge the contributions of the individuals working behind the scenes to bring this webinar to you today. At Evaluate, we have Emma Perk and Cheryl Endress. And helping us out on the technical side of things at Maytech Networks at Maricopa Community Colleges in Tempe, Arizona, are Mike Lasecki, Janet Pinhorn, and Tim Suchomsky. And Mike also contributed by giving us feedback on a draft version of this webinar. So thanks very much to all these fine folks at Evaluate and Maytech. I want to point out that the views uh, expressed in this webinar today are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the National Science Foundation. Yes, the slides from this webinar are available on Evaluate's website, as well as the evaluation reporting checklist that Kelly will be discussing today. We are recording this webinar, and we will post the recording uh, on the Evaluate website when it's ready in a day or two, and we'll email you the link. I'll also point out for a few more slides, you can find a link to the slides and handouts just to the right of the slide area if you want to grab those now. I have just one more housekeeping item before we get into the substance of today's webinar. At the end of this webinar, we have a very short feedback survey for you to complete. And this is so important to us. I want to take a moment to tell you why. First of all, NSF funds evaluate. That's us. And because of that funding, we are able to put on free webinars for you like this one. And all we ask in return is that you give us one to two minutes of your time at the end of the webinar to share your honest feedback about your experience. And along with other data that we collect, that enables us to provide NSF with evidence of the quality and impact of our webinars. And if that evidence shows that the investments has been worthwhile, it's going to be more likely that NSF will continue to fund this work. And just as importantly, we do use the feedback to improve what we do. So please stick around at the end of the webinar to share your feedback. 
Today's webinar will be presented in three main sections. First, Kelly will illustrate the anatomy of a user-friendly evaluation report. Then she'll share some tips for putting principles of straightforward and user-friendly evaluation reporting into practice. And finally, she'll highlight some features of our evaluation reporting checklist with you. And Kelly will invite you to review that checklist and give us feedback for improving it, because we do still consider it a draft at this point. We'll have a question break at the end of each of these three sections, so please type your questions in the chat area at any time. I'll be monitoring the chat box, and then I'll present those questions to Kelly at the breaks. Okay, we're all set, so I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Kelly. Thank you, Lori, and hello, everyone. So I want to first clarify that when referring to evaluation reports, I'm referring to long-form evaluation reports. Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, long-form evaluation reports are written reports that are 10 or more pages in length, and it's the most common way information about evaluation is communicated. All right, so why am I here talking about this? So I have a PhD in interdisciplinary evaluation, and in the eight years I've been practicing evaluation, I've helped to write around 40 to 50 evaluation reports. I've also read and reviewed a lot of evaluation reports written by other people, maybe even hundreds. For example, I worked with one United Nations, United Nations agency to assess the quality of the report by helping them to develop an instrument to determine the quality and then actually reading and reviewing the reports myself and with colleagues. So I've thought about evaluation reporting a lot from both the perspective of a writer and a reader. And I have some strong feelings on the topic. So what is my honest, unfiltered thought on the current state of evaluation reporting? Well, there are some really good reports out there. I think this picture sums up my sentiments on the majority of reports. As oftentimes, reports are long and not easy to read and take a lot of mental effort. I often think, how is it possible to say so much in a report and yet so little? There's research to support my opinion. A study by the U.S. Government Accountability Office showed that despite the wide availability of evaluation reports, often these reports are not used because the available information is not organized and communicated effectively. So before talking about how to organize and communicate evaluation report content more effectively, I want to hear what user-friendly evaluation reports mean to you. So I'll give you a minute or two to type in a few words or short phrases in the chat box that answer the question, how would you describe a user-friendly evaluation report? Simple language, to the point, actionable, easy to read, useful, tailored to the audience, Clear layout, easy on the eyes, good. It looks like a lot of the ways that you all are describing this is how we're thinking of it as well. So in user-friendly reports, the barriers between the readers and information they want to know are removed or minimized. So information is easy to find, meaning readers don't have to dig through text and details for information they want to know. Information is also easy to understand because it's presented directly and not cluttered up by details. Oh. So here's a visual overview of the basic sections of an evaluation report. To make sure we're all on the same page, I want to briefly introduce each section and provide some tips along the way on how to make reports more user-friendly. Then I'll discuss evaluation reports from a more macro view in terms of how to approach and process and organize content of reports. A more micro view will be taken in section two, which focuses on practical tips and will include more detailed examples. Reports tend to start with the same general front matter, which includes a title page, table of contents, and summary. The title page tells the reader what the report is about, who wrote it, who it was written for and submitted to, and when it was written. 
We also suggest providing a preferred citation to make it easier for others to reference the evaluation report. The table of contents helps readers locate information contained within the report using page numbers. So obviously, it's important that every page be numbered. This allows readers to easily locate information as well as communicate about the content of the report. Hey, did you see that great graphic on page 23? Reports that are short and well marked may not need a table of contents. Or instead of dedicating a whole page to the table of contents, it may be possible to place the table of contents in a callout box in the beginning of the report. We recommend including at least all first and second level headers in the table of contents. This should apply to the report body as well as the appendices. Oftentimes, the table of contents only identify the page the appendices start on and do not list the specific items located in the appendices. And not identifying documents contained within the appendices uh, hurts the report's readability and navigation. The appendices should contain important documents such as data collection instruments that are important to have easy access to in order to inform a deeper understanding of the findings and can also be used to inform future evaluations. For example, looking at a questionnaire protocol to directly read the questions asked to project participants can help inform an individual's understanding of what the findings mean and the accuracy of the findings. Further, it's just way easier to glance at the table of contents to see if these documents are included rather than having to dig back through the report. The executive summary is a brief overview of key information from each section of a report, and it's designed to quickly educate readers on the report content. It's typically the most widely read section of a report, and sometimes the only section. So it should highlight the evaluations, conclusions, and recommendations. So remember in the executive summary to highlight the important information and be concise and try not to fall into the trap of trying to cram too much information into this section because it is such a widely read section of the report. The body of an evaluation report is really the meat of the report. It often starts with a project background section, which describes what's being evaluated and the larger context the project is situated within. This is a section of a report in which you'd likely find a logic model which is a table that helps to concisely describe what a project does and aims to achieve. The evaluation background section describes key factors that influence the planning and implementation of the evaluation. Items covered include purpose, scope, description of how much stakeholders participated in the evaluation planning process, evaluation budget, and any conflicts of interest. This is also a good place to document whether previous evaluations have been conducted on the project and how they may have impacted the evaluation being reported on. So for example, it may be helpful to state whether previously used instruments were refined and implemented in the evaluation that you're writing about. And this is important to note because without access to these previously created instruments, another team could it's unlikely that another team could replicate the evaluation for the same cost, since instrument development is often so resource intensive. So information presented in the evaluation background section helps readers understand the evaluation context, as well as the opportunities and constraints that influence decisions about the evaluation. The evaluation method section describes how the evaluation was implemented. Documenting evaluation methods is intended to bring transparency to the evaluation process. So in other words, after reading the methods section, it should be obvious to the reader how the evaluation was conducted and the limitations of the methods used, so the reader can assess the accuracy of the findings. Some of the important items identified in this section include evaluation questions, criteria, indicators, data sources, and data collection methods. The evaluation results section presents what was learned from the evaluation. The results section is where much of the most relevant information to readers is located. In order to encourage clear and direct answers to evaluation questions, we recommend structuring the section by evaluation questions and or criteria rather than data collection methods. Therefore, as shown on the slide, there will be separate subsections for findings and conclusions for each evaluation question. 
Findings should include analyzed data that's used to answer the evaluation question. Findings that differ across sites or demographic characteristics should be disaggregated, meaning split out into groups such as gender, and presented in the report. Conclusions are answers to evaluation questions. To ensure transparency, it should be made clear how findings justify and were used to form evaluation conclusions. The recommendation section presents suggestions for actions based on the evaluation's findings and conclusions for project decision makers to consider. Recommendations should be specific and feasible actions. Evidence from the findings should be cited to justify these recommendations. So the recommendation section may also include lessons learned from the current evaluation intended to benefit future evaluations of the project. Something such as the following could be noted. You know, this evaluation found that project graduates are more likely to respond to questionnaires sent via email than physical paper copies mailed to their home. Also, not all reports will include recommendations. For example, if the evaluator only has limited knowledge of a project, they may not include a recommendation section because they don't feel that they have the knowledge to be able to recommend next steps. But if this is the case, if the evaluator has limited knowledge and doesn't feel comfortable making recommendations, they can work collaboratively with stakeholders to interpret the results and form next steps together. The report's end matter contains acknowledgments, references, and appendices. So within the acknowledgments sections, individuals who contribute to the evaluation, either directly or indirectly, should be identified and thanked. If sources such as documents, presentations, or speeches were cited in the report, list information that allows the reader to easily locate the source. Links should be provided when possible for documents that are publicly accessible. The appendices contain supplementary information that's pertinent to the evaluation, but not critical to readers' understanding of the report. Documents often found in the appendices include an evaluation plan, list of documents reviewed, and data collection instruments. So now that we have an overview of the content of an evaluation report, let's think about the competing demands in the report planning and writing process and how to balance those demands. So demands related to accuracy, credibility, transparency, accountability often mean added detail and length for reports. In terms of reporting, accuracy of evaluation reports means the data and conclusions reflect reality. Credible or trustworthiness refers to the degree to which the report and evaluation process are believed to be of high quality. Demonstrating credibility and accuracy is achieved through transparency of the evaluation process, which happens when reports make each step of the evaluation process as clear and obvious as possible. Transparency of the evaluation process is also needed to practice accountability within the evaluation profession. This happens when enough detail is provided to allow for an assessment of the evaluation process and report. So thus, a lot of evaluation reports are long because they're trying to meet demands related to transparency, credibility, accountability, and they're not necessarily made long in spite of the readers, which can be hard to believe when actually reading the reports. Demands related to feasibility, readability, usefulness, and brevity often imply a demand for less detail and shorter reports. In terms of reporting, feasibility refers to what the evaluator can realistically produce within the given budget, time frame, and level of access to data. Readability refers to the ability to locate and understand information, and usefulness relates to the ability of users to take report content and apply it in some way to meet their needs. And brevity refers to the fact that many of us crave anything that's written to just be short and to the point. So recognizing these demands are the first step. Trying to determine a plan to balance these demands and then setting expectations with report audience members comes next. So what user-friendly means for a report will always vary depending on the context, but do share some basic ideas as have and will be presented in this webinar. In a user-friendly report, the report body should be organized based on audience members' interests. 
The first step in organizing a report based on audience member interest is identifying the audience and then finding out what information is relevant to them. It's ideal to address separate audiences separately when possible. Different audiences may require different levels of information and impact the type of language that should be used in the reports and the way the information should be presented. It's important to determine whether separate audiences would require separate reports and whether or not that's even feasible. Bottom line, identify your audience and determine what they need to know. Don't just write what you want to say. Next, consider how familiar the report audience is with the project. Internal project staff likely require less information about the project and more technical terms can be used in reporting. While potential funders or those external to the project may require more information on the project and less technical language. Also consider how involved the target audience has been in the planning of the evaluation. Individuals that have helped plan the evaluation and create data collection instruments likely want to read less information about methods in the report body as compared with individuals that have been absent from the planning process. I always have accountability to the evaluation field and what other evaluators would think when I'm writing a report. You know, would they deem this report credible and the findings accurate? You know, where would they poke holes? So I always try to identify how much detail is needed to keep things simple, yet show the evaluation was conducted in a thorough manner. And this can be a struggle as that sort of competing needs at the same time. So once audience members' interests have been identified, considerations of report organization can be made. First is the order in which the report sections are presented. The order report sections are presented determines how much material the audience needs to dig through to get to the evaluation results and should vary according to audience interests. Most often, report bodies start with a description of the project and evaluation background and method sections, followed by evaluation results and recommendations as shown. This layout works well for readers with little knowledge about the project or evaluation. However, audiences that participated in the evaluation process and that are familiar with the project may prefer an alternative order, as shown, where the evaluation results and recommendations are presented first, then followed by the evaluation background methods and project background sections. Another way to go about organizing report content in a more user-friendly way is by placing the most relevant details from each section in the report body and moving less relevant details to the appendices. So necessary details that should be included in the report body are those that are essential for basic understanding of the report content. And less relevant details that enhance understanding of the content but are not essential for getting the basic message should be included in the appendices. Placing supporting details in the appendices can also help to minimize report length. So here's a hypothetical example. If all details are included, the report body may be 50 pages, as well as the length of appendices. However, if only the most relevant details are included in the report body and less relevant supporting details in the appendices, the length of the report body could be minimized in half to 25 pages. And theoretically, then, the appendices would expand to 75 pages. So I've been working on trying to implement this more and more in my own work. And you know, I found it sort of challenging. Um, you know, the academic in me wants to document everything and feels like if I put it in the end of the report that no one's going to read it, and it's sort of a waste of time. But I also know how valuable and vital it is to document details um, of the evaluation process in sufficient detail, especially things like methodology that audience members not, might not find very interesting. Because understanding methods in particular is key to understanding evaluation conclusions, as well as demonstrating accuracy and rigor of the evaluation. So I was somewhat recently introduced to the acronym TLDR, which I wholeheartedly enjoy, and wanted to find out how many of you are familiar with the term. So please take a moment to identify what TLD stands for in the poll box.
All right, it looks like the majority of people um, are identifying too long didn't read. But I do sort of agree, totally lame, don't read, could apply. So TLDR is an internet shorthand for too long didn't read. Uh, which implies the notion that an individual is justified in not taking the time to read something if the writer has not taken the time to present the message in a clear and concise manner. I'm guilty of this myself. The first few reports I worked on were long and overly detailed, where I thought were hallmarks of rigorous and high quality reports at the time. Sadly, I think this sums up much of the thoughts around evaluation reporting. But there is hope, as discussion around how to make reports more user-friendly has been steadily increasing. So no evaluator wants their hard work to become a dust collector. And no project staff want to read an evaluative novel if it's possible to have high-quality cliff notes. Thus, another aspect to consider in the quest for more user-friendly reports is minimization of report length. However, minimizing report length should not compromise report quality. These can seem like competing goals at times, but I'll provide some tips on how to do this in the next section. This graph shows our guidelines for report page length and proportion. We recognize that recommendations on page length cannot always be followed. So we've also provided an estimate of the proportion of the report body that each section should make up. And as you see, the result section should make up the majority of the body of a report. So in summary, balancing reporting demands, balance reporting demands, and remember what user-friendly means is context-specific. There is no one-size-fits-all answer. Organize report sections based on audience interests. Minimize report length without compromising quality. All right, I'll now turn it over to Lori for some questions. Well, thank you, Kelly. Um, first question, do you have advice about how much methodological detail to include in an evaluation report? Um, I would say this really depends on the audience and how much information they want to know. Um, one really helpful way to go about this, um, in the checklist we've actually included a paperclip symbol next to items that we think could be um, partially or fully addressed within the appendices of the report. Um, and so within the method section, there's a lot of those paperclips to kind of give you an idea of what items um, you may just want to briefly summarize in the report body and those that you might want to put more details on in the appendices. Okay, and Donna is asking, do you have thoughts on numbering headings and subheadings? Interesting. Um, I think it depends. Um, probably on your organization and the culture of the organization. Um, I would think that if a report is laid out well enough that you shouldn't need numbers. Um, but I do know, you know, there are some instances, like within the UN, um, where that sort of thing is needed. Okay, and Margot is asking, should the executive summary be kept to, is there a minimum or maximum length for mo to be most effective for executive summaries? Uh, the recommendations uh, suggest one to three pages. So it, it needs to be something that will keep the interest of the reader. Okay, so thank you, Kelly. And Sarah, I'm just trying to keep up with the question. Sarah is asking, would you recommend the same format when reporting lots of qualitative data, such as from focus groups or community input meetings? And I think she asked that question when you had the overall overview of the evaluation report. Um, yes and no. I, I think that probably the qualitative, um, you know, an overview of the qualitative data could be presented in the findings in the report body, and then maybe some of the more detailed responses. Um, sometimes people like to put in the raw data. That sort of information could be put in the appendices. So I think the same format could be followed. Okay, and um, Goldie asks, is there any information or literature on who really needs evaluation reports and how that shapes the format of a report? Um, 
I think from what I've read, it usually implies talking to the client and just um, trying to identify who is the reader, who, who is the audience, and then talking to the audience and finding out what information they need. Um, it seems to always go back to just having contact with the audience and directly communicating about your needs. Because it's always going to differ. So a general set of guidelines can't um, give you all the information you need. Okay, Kelly, in the interest of time, there are some more questions coming in, but we'll save them for the next break. In the interest of time, I think we'll go ahead and move on to your next section. Thank you. All right, thank you, Lori, and thank you, everyone. So this section focuses on specific practical tips and includes detailed examples of how to make reports more user-friendly. So as a reminder, in user-friendly evaluation reports, readers should be able to easily find information that they need and easily understand the information they find. This implies taking into account interests of all intended audiences and barriers that may influence ease of understanding and navigation of the report, such as reading level, language, color, visuals, and headings, and other issues related to visual accessibility, such as contrast level of the colors and font size. So uh, one of the general recommendations is to use plain language. Plain language is writing that allows readers to understand the content as quickly, easily, and completely as possible. And using plain language doesn't imply that you're dumbing down the material. It just means that you're making it appropriate for the intended audiences. This means that jargon or unnecessary technical terms should not be used when there are everyday terms that can convey the same message. Also consider using the simplest form of general terms, such as verbs. For example, the choice to select the verb use over utilize. On the slide you can see I've included an example of a somewhat overly complicated sentence, which I will read. The primary intended audiences of the evaluation include instrumental uses for formative purposes, conceptual uses for capacity development, and symbolic uses for persuasive purposes. To me, that just said a lot of nothing. Now, on the right side of your screen, you'll see a more simplified version of the sentence. Evaluation is intended to be used to improve the project, enhance staff understanding of the project, and demonstrate that the organization values accountability. This sentence gives me a much better idea of how the evaluation is intended to be used, and meaning was not lost in the translation. We also recommend using short sentences. So sentences should contain no more than 25 words. Only one idea should be communicated per sentence. Personally, I'm horrible at this, which I like to blame on working in an academic institution. But for me, and I guess most people, being concise and clear in your, your writing will require extra effort. However, that extra effort will pay off. In the example shown on the screen, the text block on the left is one sentence, a sentence that is long and difficult to read and understand. The same sentence has been broken up into three more digestible segments on the right side of the screen. The moral of the story is to use short sentences to enhance understanding of report content. And if you're like me, the extra effort will be worth it in the end, and you'll get better at it over time. Or so I keep telling myself. We also recommend simplifying messages, which is a related concept. Overly wordy messages that don't get the point across are in my top five list of pet peeves in life. I feel like it's a little harsh and perhaps hypocritical to say because I'm not amazing at this myself, but like the message of TLDR, if you aren't going to take the time to say it simply, I don't want to take the time, the extra time to read it to try to understand it. So the same super long sentence used in the previous example is shown on the left. A much shorter sentence is presented on the right that captures the gist of the message. Simplifying messages, again, which have really overlaps with both use of plain language and short sentences, takes extra time and should be factored into the evaluation report writing timeline. In terms of making things easier to find, the first tip is simple yet vital. Use headings to help readers visually navigate reports. Headings and subheadings should be concise yet descriptive and should clearly distinguish report sections. 
Headings also help to break up material into more logical and understandable pieces. Differentiate headings by using a variety of font sizes, bolding, italics, and indentation. And no matter what format you use, just be sure to use it consistently throughout the report. Place key takeaway messages in call-out boxes, which are um, Call-out boxes contain a short string of text that are set off from the text body in order to highlight a key piece of information. For example, the following call-out boxes were placed in an evaluation results section and highlight key findings and the conclusions related to performance level that address the evaluation questions. So similarly, state key information in the beginning of sections. An evaluation report is not a dramatic novel. It should not be filled with lots of suspense. In fact, if done well, it should be the opposite of suspenseful. So in creating this webinar, we debated on what term to use to re refer to what we're calling running text. To make sure we're all on the same page in the poll box, please take a moment to select what you think we are referring to when I say running text. Okay, so this is really interesting. It looks like the majority of people are saying paragraph length sentences, which makes sense, and I put on there because there's sort of the notion of like the running sentence. So what we meant by it, and perhaps this is a good test and indication, this was not the best term to select, um, is actually text that's arranged in paragraph form and can also be referred to as text body. So the thought of reading five pages or less of straight text makes me cringe. Using alternative forms of presenting information helps to add some variety and make the information more digestible and me cringe less. This helps to add white space on the page, space where text is not present, which also helps to make the report easier to read. Some alternatives to running text include bulleted lists, tables, images, drawings, charts, graphs, and maps. I'll run through a few examples. Let's start with bulleted lists. Bulleted lists can be used in wanting to list or break out one type of information. A bulleted list can be especially helpful in highlighting level of importance, helping readers understand the order of events, and helping readers identify individual steps in a process. So bulleted lists are often used in the recommendation section of an evaluation report. It helps to highlight the actionable suggestions learned during the evaluation process. The text shown on the left is an example of a recommendation section presented as running text. When looking at the same information presented in a bulleted list as shown on the right, I find the information much easier to read and am visually curious and motivated to read it. And this sort of phenomenon is helpful because recommendation sections are often intended to be read by decision makers who tend to be busy people, and the bulleted list helps meet their need for ease and speed of readability. Tables should be used when you want to show the connection between different types of information. For example, when describing evaluation methods, components, in separate paragraphs, it can be difficult to clearly communicate how each of these interrelated components are linked together. And being clear about these linkages between the evaluation questions, criteria, indicators, data sources, it's really important part of being transparent in the evaluation process and demonstrating credibility, accuracy, and accountability within a report. So using a table instead of or in addition to running text uh, allows for the efficient and clear presentation of connections between the questions, criteria, indicators, data sources, and data collection methods. So I admit, I'm a sort of a nerd, and by default tend to think in sort of mental tables. And I need clear linkages between components of an evaluation methods in order to feel like I'm really understanding what's going on. So I always use a table similar to this in my evaluation plans and reports. In my opinion, having a table like this addresses the competing demands of both transparency and credibility, while also balancing the demands of feasibility, readability, and usefulness. So personally, again, in my opinion, 
Um, I think such a table should be a requirement of every evaluation report. And you can find a modifiable data collection planning matrix worksheet created by Evaluate in the recommendation section of the checklist we'll be discussing later. You can also use similar tables to communicate other information about methods as well. So at one time, I wanted to document how recommendations were generated based on input from multiple questionnaires and interview types in order to demonstrate the credibility and accuracy of the recommendations I was presenting. So I first tried writing everything out in paragraph form and became frustrated because I felt like I was saying a lot but not getting my point across. So then I used a similar table um, to link together uh, the type of instruments that were used, the data sources, the sample size and response rate for each inter instrument, and then whether quantifiable or qualitative types of data were collected in the instruments. In the evaluation results section, describing the findings and conclusions as distinct sections is important for readability and transparency. But it can also prevent demonstration of clear connections between conclusions or answers to evaluation questions and the findings that justify those answers. And this is especially problematic when there are many or complex indicators or criteria involved. Thus, a similar styled table can be used in the evaluation results section that transparently demonstrates the links between evaluation questions, criteria, conclusions, and findings. Such a table is especially helpful when there are many evaluation questions or criteria. For example, I'm working on an evaluation that has predetermined evaluation questions A through K. That's 11 questions. Clearly demonstrating the link between 11 questions and related criteria, findings, and conclusions is really challenging in general. Um, and therefore, I include a table similar to the one shown in the executive summary of the report because just even listing the 11 evaluation questions and providing the related conclusions and findings within one to three pages is a nearly impossible feat. But this table has allowed me to do that and I'm pretty happy with how it's turned out. Again, this is my biased opinion, but I think such, sta such tables should be a staple of evaluation reporting because it helps to balance the transparency, accountability, and readability while also meeting the demands of feasibility and brevity. Although using such a table in the evaluation results section may not always be needed. Charts. Charts show information in the form of a graph or diagram and are very helpful in promoting readability, usefulness, and brevity. The following is an example of a quantitative project result that are presented in paragraph form. However, it's often much more efficient to present them in a chart, such as the one shown on the right. The chart presents information in a much easier to consume manner than the text and helps to support the narration and allows the readers to visually understand the text. We also suggest including both a title for the chart, such as the traditional figure one title shown below the chart, as well as a takeaway message near the chart that's, that's near the chart but not buried within the text. And this caters to individuals who may be skimming the report to ensure they see key pieces of takeaway information and also helps to highlight and reinforce key points for those reading the entire text body. Images are representations of external form of a person or thing. A photo, drawing, or statue are forms of images. The text on the left is a copy and pasted from the National Science Foundation's Flickr page. It describes NSF's 2015 Take Your Daughter and Sons to Work Day. I'll give you a moment to read it. While well, the text provides, describes the event, the image adds information and a level of credibility that's difficult to achieve in text while also maintaining brevity and readability. So to summarize the recommendations of this section, use plain language that allows readers to understand the content as quickly and easily as possible. Use short sentences with no more than 25 words. 
Simplify messages. Remember the message of TLDR. If you aren't going to take the time to say it simply, which does take extra time, readers shouldn't have to take the extra time to try to understand it. Use headings to help readers visually navigate the report. Headings and subheadings should be concise, descriptive, and clearly distinguish report sections. Also, use call-out boxes, which house the short string of text and are set off from the text body, and help highlight key pieces of information. To help make key information easier to find and understand, don't just rely on the traditional running text. Use alternative forms of presenting the information to make the content more digestible, such as the bulleted lists, tables, images, maps, graphs, charts that we've discussed. All right, I'll now turn it back over to Lori for some more questions. Well, thanks, Ken. So several people, I'm going to take this first question, Kelly. So several people were asking, do we have examples of evaluation reports that we think are especially good or that meet these uh, you know, criteria and these, these principles? Um, I so wish that we had that to share with everybody. Um, and there's a couple reasons we don't. You may have noticed in the webinar invitation that we actually invited people to share examples of reports they thought were especially user friendly and exemplary. And we had hoped that we would get at least a few of those that we could share on the webinar. Um, the problem, part of the problem is a lot of these reports, probably some that are done extremely well, are private and confidential. Um, and then and, and the other problem we run into is we'll find aspects of a report that may be really strong and then other aspects that aren't. So it's difficult to find like the, the perfect report to share. Um, however, in seeing this demand that I'm seeing in the chat for this, you know, these exemplary reports, my, I'm going to pledge publicly that uh, we are producing a, an evaluation report um, for our project this year in collaboration with our external evaluator. And it is my pledge to make this as, as excellent as possible so we could set it up to demonstrate some of these principles in a real world evaluation context. So that's that's a, the people, the thing everyone really wanted to know. Um, so I'll move on to a question that was asked in the first section from both Melissa and Mary Lee. How would you recommend approaching a report that has an unclear audience? So it might be, you know, like a, there might be a primary audience, but you don't know who it's going to go to ultimately. Um, so I think, you know, this in part falls under feasibility. How much time um, do you have to dedicate to this? Um, and it sort of depends, you know, on the, the topic um, in terms of balancing it. I think. Um, I think getting feedback on drafts um, from your clients just to see how they're reacting to it. Um, so even though the audience may be wide, um, just getting feedback from the, the clients can help sort of um, help maybe rein in that focus a little bit. Um, but yeah, that is a, it's sort of a challenging position and, you know, forces you to try to balance all of these demands that we've talked about. Kelly, I'll just add on to that. I really did like your suggestion in the beginning about sort of balancing the needs for like utility, be, utility and feasibility um, with the credibility and transparency and all that by putting some of those technical details in the appendix. That way you've covered yourself if you do put a report out that's maybe intended more for a lay audience, if it gets in the hands of, you know, high you know, more of a technical audience, they have that documentation if you need it. So I think that's a good way of sort of covering all your bases. Um, I just wanted to r remind people of that suggestion that you had. Uh, we had another question about the use of color to highlight, uh, use of color in reports, um, for example, in graphics. Could you comment on that? Yes. Um, so, um, you know, not using colors like blue and green because people that are colorblind can't distinguish the differences. There's a lot of resources out there to help you with that in terms of creating graphics to show which colors to use. Also in terms of um, for people with low vision, um, making sure that there's enough contrast um, so that it's easy to see. So those are suggestions that I would make. Okay, good. And we had another example, uh, sorry, question about the use of infographics to highlight findings. And that reminds me, I said that we didn't get examples of evaluation reports, but we actually did get um, a really nice example of an uh, infographic style report. Um, so I didn't want to dismiss that. But Yvonne is asking in general, what do you think about the use of infographics to highlight findings? 
I think that they're great. And the example we got was really awesome. It was the first one that I've seen that sort of like set up an evaluation report style. So there were the evaluation questions and then, you know, the key findings and conclusions that supported it. So I think it can be really helpful. But, um, you know, so I try to specify at the beginning we're talking about, you know, long form evaluation reports. But I do think the infographics serve a purpose. Um, and are really helpful to use and can be included in the reports, but they would just be, um, again, an inclusion in the report and not the report. Okay, we do have some more questions, and I think I'm just going to save those for the last break so we can go ahead and move on to our final session. Thanks, everyone, for your questions. Sorry about that. So uh, the checklist for straightforward evaluation reporting is one of the materials made available as part of this webinar. And this checklist was developed by Lori and myself based on evaluation literature, our own experience, and input from experts. So much of the content of this webinar is based on the checklist, and hopefully it's something that you'll find useful. So the checklist contains a quick reference list of report content and straightforward reporting tips on the first page. Within the checklist, there are detailed lists of content for each report section, as well as a brief description of the content to be included, specific suggestions on how to apply the general straightforward guidelines in each section of the report, and a list of recommended resources that expand on tips presented in the checklist. Um, for example, I saw one of the comments asking about um, formatting and layout. So there is actually a checklist that we recommend in that resource section that addresses that. Um, and actually, it's Stephanie Evergreen's Evaluation Report Layout Checklist. Some of the other resources we have in there is Evaluate's Data Collection Planning Matrix, um, and then the Center for Disease Control's Clear Writing Checklist, which is amazing and very helpful. To help you figure out the type of details to include in the report body versus the appendices, we place a paperclip symbol next to items that can likely be partially or entirely addressed in the appendices, just to help you sort of figure out um, and navigate that process. So the checklist for straightforward evaluation reporting is not the only evaluation reporting checklist out there. In fact, you can find references to some of the other checklists in the recommended resources section at the conclusion of the checklist. So just out of curiosity, I wanted to find out how many of you have used other evaluation reporting checklists. So please respond by indicating yes or no in the poll box. Okay, so it looks like roughly about a third have um, and two-thirds haven't. So that's really interesting and helpful for us to know. So how is this checklist different from the existing checklist? So first, the straightforward reporting checklist is different in that it was designed to assist in the report writing process and was not created as an instrument to score report quality. Although checklists created to score report quality can also be used to assist with report writing. It's just they just weren't designed for this purpose. Second, it was developed for a general audience, meaning for evaluation professionals and individuals with little to no evaluation experience. It's also not sector specific and can be used by a general audience. Third, the checklist has a dual focus on content, so what information to include in the report, and organization and presentation of the content in the form of specific tips on how to make evaluation reporting more straightforward. I do want to make two caveats regarding the checklist. First, these are only suggestions and not requirements. Second, sponsor guidelines supersede all suggestions made within the checklist. Essentially, we're just presenting a bunch of ideas for you to consider, and this is not how you are required to write an evaluation report, because what's best will vary across contexts. So this evaluation and checklist can be used by evaluators and project staff for several purposes. So first, the checklist can be used to educate emerging evaluators and project staff about the evaluation process and content of evaluation reports. I know when I was new to evaluation, I found them very helpful and formative, even when it came to just reinforcing information I already knew. 
You can also think of the checklist as a menu of sorts um, that lists all of the potential evaluation information that can be included in the report. While it may not be a mouth-watering menu, this informational menu can be used to help facilitate conversation about evaluation reporting, as well as a list from which to identify the information that audience members are most interested in. The checklist can also be used as an accountability mechanism by evaluators and project staff. So evaluators can use the checklist to keep themselves accountable and verify content hasn't been overlooked. I still like to refer to report checklist to make sure I haven't missed anything when I begin outlining a report. The checklist can also be used by project staff to learn what to expect from evaluation reports in terms of content and presentation. So for example, project staff could compare the checklist with the report content and use it as a tool to prompt questions about choices surrounding the evaluator's inclusion or exclusion of certain report content. So while in this webinar, I said to identify what the audience informal interests are. Sometimes the audience don't know what they want from an evaluation report, or they're not very specific because they're not familiar with the options. So to address this issue, during the evaluation planning phase, I've begun um, to provide clients with examples of past reports in order to facilitate a discussion about what their reporting expectations and needs are. Um, and I recommend, when possible, that evaluators share de-identified sample reports with clients to help establish reporting expectations. I also recommend that project staff ask evaluators for sample reports to assist in the evaluator selection process or to help decide what they want in their project evaluation report. So here's your call to action. Um, I urge everyone to try something new, evaluators in your reporting, project staff um, in what you request from your evaluator in their next report. Get feedback flowing. Evaluators ask clients for feedback on the user friendliness of the reports you provide them. And project staff ask, um, provide feedback on the user friendliness of your evaluators' reports, even if it's not solicited. I'm sure they would appreciate it, or at least I would. Share the checklist with colleagues to help encourage more straightforward reporting and practices and dialogue on the topic. And if anyone's interested in testing the checklist out, next time you write an evaluation report and want to provide us with some feedback, please contact me via email, which is shown on the slide. And we'll use that feedback to further improve and refine the checklist. All right, I'll now hand it back over to Lori for some more questions. Well, thank you, Kelly. So Sarah has a question. How do you balance using tables when people who aren't used to, for people who aren't used to reading tables? Would you ever put the same information in a table and paragraph form if your audience includes table readers and non-table readers? Um, so I think it depends, like, what section of the report you're talking about, like findings versus methods. Um, this also brings up the idea of there potentially needing to be separate reports for separate audiences. Um, you know, again, I think that I would recommend um, in this situation of, you know, drafting something and getting feedback on it to see, um, you know, whether what you're doing is working. Because, you know, whether or not it's working is always going to depend on the context and the audience and clients you're working with. Okay, and Jennifer is asking, do you have tips for formatting reports? Is there a set of templates you use, like in Word or Publisher? Um, do you have any recommendations along those lines? You know, I don't, but I would really like to look into that. Um, in terms of just like, so it's not a template, but again, like I had mentioned um, in our recommended resources, there's Stephanie Evergreen's Evaluation Report Layout Checklist. So that gives some information on um, how to set up a report. But no, I would love to actually find out if there are some templates and would love if anyone out there knows of them to share it with us. I'll just add to that what I like to do is just look for design, report designs that I like and just steal their designs. But that's not the same as a template. <laughs> Um, Odile is asking, do you make formatting choices like with regard to heading size, color, indentation, font size, use of space, so those formatting choices, do you decide on that ahead of time or, or do you format after you have the first draft? And they're noting that it, it seems like it could affect the content. Um, yeah, I think I always try to outline a report first, but 
that usually a lot of times changes. So, you know, I think you just sort of do the best you can. Um, so yeah, that's just what I do. I try, I try to set it up as much as possible to help with the format, um, but, you know, it does change. Okay, so I think that that's all the questions we can handle right now, but I'm asking everyone to just hang out for a couple more minutes. We are going to get to that important feedback survey at the end. I want to let you know we have two webinars coming up on February 15th. I'll be leading our webinar on small scale evaluation, and that's about how to properly scope an evaluation to fit a small project and set the stage for future funding and project growth. And then on March 22nd, we're going to break down outcome evaluation in into manageable steps. And you can register for those webinars on our website right now. But first, it's time for your part of this process and complete our feedback survey. The link should is right there on your screen. Just click on that. I'll ask anyone who's a presenter not to uh, touch that link. And when you're finished with the survey, you can go ahead and sign out of the webinar. And thank you all so much for enjoy joining us today. More than 300 people were online today. It was amazing. Uh, we hope to see you back here in February for our next webinar. And thank you so much, Kelly, for sh sharing your uh, lots, just amazing wealth of experience on reporting today.